Hello, everybody. Welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. Today we have John Bias. I think you all know him. University of California, Riverside. And he's going to give something like a follow-up talk to his talk of last week at the UCR seminar, but the talk should be self-contained. It's going to be about structured co spans and petri nets. So please, John, you're welcome. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, so one of the few good side effects of coronavirus is the way some academics have been starting to open up their seminars to the world by having them be broadcast online. And Paulo Perone has been really doing a great job of <clears throat> trying out the different technologies for doing that. So now we have a combined Zoom and YouTube broadcast, which we'll see how that works. And so I really encourage mathematicians to get to know each other better at these uh, online seminars, both at MIT and then at UCR, have an applied category theory at UCR seminar, which is <clears throat> at 1 p.m. on Eastern time on Wednesdays. Uh, but you can also see it <clears throat> afterwards on YouTube and the next one, April 15th, is going to be Jules Hedges and then Michael Shulman. And you can see this list of people, really good people talking. Um, if you want to find out more about that, you can see the, this, uh, go to this URL at the bottom here, tinyurl.com, ACT UCR. And both our seminar and the MIT seminar have started having discussions on a kind of chat site, a technology called Zulip that's good for having conversations and supports LaTeX, by the way. Uh, and so my student Christian Williams started one up called the Category Theory Community Server. And so right after this talk, uh, you can ask more questions and talk about things there. Uh, and you can figure out how that works by going to tinyurl slash category Zulip. And this is a pretty lively place now. There's a lot of discussions of category theory going on there all the time. So that's another thing that should have come into existence a long time ago, but it finally has. Uh, and then at MIT, there's going to be the big annual applied category theory conference, ACT 2020. <clears throat> so it was going to be held physically at MIT, but now it's gone virtual. Uh, and so it's going to be everywhere. And in fact, they've cleverly had the uh, <coughs> talk scheduled in blocks uh, spaced in such a way that no matter where you are on the globe, there'll be some talks going on while you're wide awake and all the talks will be recorded. So if you're not wide awake, you can see them afterwards. And that conference will be from July 6th to 10th, and on May 16th is the deadline for submitting papers. So all talks are chosen by submitting papers, which can be published already or, or not published. And so please, if you're doing anything interesting in the category theory, especially with an applied twist, um, check that out at act2020.mit.edu. So all of these are examples of how mathematics has gone online. And I hope it stays online after this terrible disease outbreak ends, because I think that would be one of the few benefits of this whole episode that could last. OK, so I'm going to talk about structured coast bands and open Petri nets. Um, this is work I've done with my student, Kenny Courser, who, by the way, desperately needs a job. And he's the one who's been working on structured coast bands. And my student, Jade Master, who's been working on Petri nets and who will need a job, but doesn't yet. Uh, so what's a Petri net? So Petri nets are a very simple formalism that computer scientists like as a very simple model for computations of a certain sort, distributed computations. So it just consists of a finite set of what we call places, which I'll draw as these yellow circles and another finite set of what are called transitions, which are these 
aqua boxes. And then for any place and any transition, there's a natural number, which will draw as a natural number of edges going from that place to that transition. So here, for example, there's one edge going from here to here, or zero edges going from here to here. And then similarly, another natural number for each place transition pair, which we think of, which we draw as edges going from that transition to that place. So this would be two going from this transition to this place. It's important to note that while I'm drawing these, this Petri net is a graph, the edges don't have an individuality of their own. So there's not a set of edges. They're just these natural numbers. So you're not allowed to ask like which of these edges is which. They're just two edges from here to here. Uh, so they're just natural numbers. I'm, I'm taking the liberty of drawing them as a finite set of edges, but that's not really what a Petri net has. Okay, so th the idea is that you think of the places as different kinds of things. Sometimes, in fact, in chemistry, they're called different species. In chemistry, a species could be a type of atom, a type of molecule, a type of ion or something. And then the transitions are ways for these different types of things to turn into different other types of things. So for example, you might have one atom and another atom turn into some molecule. Uh, or uh, there are applications of this in epidemiology, which I described last week, where you have an infected patient and a, a susceptible uh, person meeting and and giving rise to, well, maybe another infected patient or something else like that. Um, so it's an incredibly flexible framework in short. It's not limited to any one field. It's really applicable whenever you have things that can turn into other things. Um, and so what you do when you're thinking about them mathematically is that you, 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 you want to imagine a process where you, things are happening. And so you start by putting a finite number of of dots in each place. So we could, those dots are called tokens in the Petri net literature. And that, and that assignment is called a marking. And then you can repeatedly move the tokens around using the transition. So starting from this initial marking, I could move, move these, one of each of these tokens to over, over there. And so then I would get this marking. Um, yeah, I did that right. Um, and then now I have only one thing I can do at this point, which is the only thing I'm able to do is to move this one uh, through here. I can't use this transition now because there aren't two tokens uh, here waiting to, to, to go into it. So we say this transition is not enabled or it can't fire, whereas this transition can fire. And so if I do it, then I, I, I get two tokens uh, in this place now, and now this, now this transition on top is enabled now, so I can fire it, and I get this, and then now, the, uh, well, now the, now I have a choice. I could I could do that transition, or I could do that transition. Uh, if I pick one of them to do, then I could I could I could get there. So we can move these around in this way, and that's called the token game sometimes. And one of the questions you can ask about any Petri net is given an initial marking. What other markings can you get to by a sequence of transitions? And that's a mathematical question called the reachability problem. And the interesting thing about the reachability problem is that it's solvable. So it's 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 not like uh, it's not like when you get to a level of complexity of a Turing machine where you can get undecidable problems. So it's a decidable problem, but it's decidable in an extremely slow way. So the, the, the time for solving it grows faster than exponentially. It grows, grows like, I think, something like an Ackerman function of the second order, which is like some super Ackerman function. So it's interesting that it's uh, decidable, but, but very, very hard to decide. So that means, that in some sense, in some rough sense, that means that Petri nets have less computational power than a Turing machine, but still a lot. Well, the rough part is that a lot. Uh, I, I wish I could make that more precise. Um, 
So if you're a category theorist, though, you may think, well, OK, we've got these different markings and then these different ways to go from one marking to another. So there should be some category lurking around here where the markings are objects and then the sequences of transitions that you can fire one after the other would be giving you morphisms. And it's true. So let's make this a little bit more mathematical. So a Petri net is a diagram of sets of this form where you have a set of places, S, and a set of transitions, T. And then each uh, transition has a source and a target, uh, sort of like when you have a graph in category theory. But the source and target are not a single uh, place, but they're a formal finite sum of places. So going back here, this transition here, its source would be this place plus this place. Or the tr target of this transition would be uh, this place plus itself, or you could say two times that place. Uh, so n of s means this set of formal finite sums of elements of s, or we can make that a little bit more mathematical and think of that as the free commutative monoid on s. So, or to be a little bit more precise still, uh, it's the underlying set of the free commutative monoid on s. So there's an adjunction between sets and commutative monoids, where every commutative monoid has an underlying set. And then the left adjoint is that you can freely form a commutative monoid from a set by formally adding elements of that set and taking finite formal sums to all possible finite formal sums of elements of that set form the free commutative monoid on that. Uh, but this is a diagram of sets. So we want to take that commutative monoid and, and think, of it as a, think of it as a set. So to be uh, nitpicky, nitpicky and precise, we want, to, uh, we want to apply this forgetful functor here. So, so n is really this uh, monad on set. So that's what a Petri net is to, from a mathematician's point of view, or maybe I should say a category theorist's point of view. Um, and so I'm suggesting that any Petri net gives a category. It gives a symmetric monoidal category where the objects are markings and the morphisms are generated by transitions. So from this object here, that is this marking, there will be some morphism going to this object, and then another morphism going to this object, and we can compose them and get other morphisms in our category by composition. So it took me a while to understand what kind of symmetric monoidal category we actually get. This was actually in the literature somewhere, but I was struggling to figure it out myself. <clears throat> and it, me a little while to realize that you really have to think of it as a commutative monoidal category. So a commutative monoidal category is a rather dramatically uh, symmetric category where the braiding is actually the identity morphism. That is, we're switching two things has no effect whatsoever. Um, ca category theorists don't talk about them too much because they like uh, McLean's theorem that says that any symmetric monoidal category can be strictified to one where the associator and unitor are identity morphisms, that is, put parentheses around in your tensor product, uh, but, but that theorem does not get you down to the point of making the braiding be the identity as well. So that's usually considered like a crazy thing to want, to have the braiding be the identity. But that's actually here. So there are different ways to think of commutative monoidal categories. One is to think of it as follows, as a category internal to the category common. So what the heck does that mean? So it means it's a category where instead of just having a set of objects, you have a commutative monoid of objects. And where instead of just having a set of morphisms, you have a commutative monoid of morphisms. And where all the uh, 
structure of the category, the source and target maps composition and the map that assigns to each object its identity, all those maps are commutative monoid homomorphisms. So they get along with the, I'll call it addition operation in your commutative monoid. Um, so we've already seen, for example, that you can add markings on a Petri net because uh, the set of markings on the Petri net is just the free commutative monoid on the set of places. So there we're seeing that the objects in our category that we get from a Petri net, they aren't just elements of a set, they're elements of a commutative monoid. And similarly, we can add transitions, it turns out. So that's one way to think of a commutative monoidal category. But another way to think about it is that it's a symmetric monoidal category where everything is the identity. That is, the braiding morphisms are identities, the associators are identities, and the left and right unitors are identities. So it's a very simple sort of symmetric monoidal category. And some people would say it's too simple to be interesting, but it actually is a somewhat interesting subject in itself. These these commutative monoidal categories. Um, so any Petri net gives a commutative monoidal category, which I'll call F of P, where P is your Petri net. And so as I've said a couple times now, the objects are going to be the markings of the Petri net. And then the morphisms will be generated from the transitions. It should be, say, the transitions of P. That's a typo there. Uh, by composition and by tensor product. So you can just freely start composing and tensoring transitions. You know what their source and target are, because that's part of the data of the Petri net. So you know when you're allowed to compose them. So you just go ahead and do that. But then you impose the laws of a commutative monoidal category on that. And so you get the free commutative monoidal category on a Petri net. And yeah, so at first you'll notice I only talked about composing sequences of morphisms. Now I'm talking about composing them and also tensoring them. Uh, but I believe that <clears throat> due to the commutative monoidal category rules, you can always take uh, something generated from comp composition and tensor product and write it just as a, as a composite. So all you need uh, are composites in a certain sense. So my first remarks were not false, I believe. Okay, so, so, so what you can think of is a Petri net is like a method of presenting a commutative monoidal category, which is free in the sense that there are no interesting relations between the morphisms. Um, and we can make that intuition more precise. Well, as soon as I say the word free, I'm hinting at some kind of left adjoint uh, functor, and that's that's true. So let's get some categories going before we start talking about functors. So there's a category of Petri nets, <clears throat> and it's sort of the obvious thing uh, if you're trained in category theory. So an object will be a Petri net, and then a morphism from one Petri net to another is a pair of functions. Right? Because a Petri net involves two sets, the set of transitions and the set of places. A morphism of Petri nets should involve two functions. One, a map from transitions of your first Petri net to transitions of your second Petri net. And one for, from mapping places to places, making the obvious diagrams commute. That is, you have the source and target map in a Petri net. And so we want it to be that if you map over a transition and then take the source. It's the same as if you take the source and then map over. <clears throat> but notice that the source of a transition is a, a finite sum of places. So to map over one of those to another, we have to use the fact that this n is, is a functor. So that it applies not only to sets, but also to functions. Uh, Remember, n here was the uh, monad that assigns to any set 
the set of finite sums of its elements. So if you can map from S to S prime, you can map a finite sum to a finite sum in just the obvious way. <clears throat> and same here with transitions. So that's, that's the category of Petri nets. And so if you want a picture of that, here's an example of what a morphism of Petri nets can do. So everything in the top picture is getting mapped to something directly below it. Um, so these two transitions here are getting mapped to this one. Sorry, these two places are getting mapped to this place. Uh, these two transitions are getting mapped to this one. This place is getting mapped to this one. So this whole top Petri net is getting squashed down to this part here. But then just for fun, I've also put in some, an extra transition in this target Petri net here to show you that we can do a couple of different types of things with a morphism of Petri net. So one thing we're doing here is we're taking a sort of fancy model of a situation and collapsing it down to a simpler model. And that's something we may often want to do. For example, if we have some transition where water can do something and also heavy water can do something, some other isotope of water, well, some, some water with a different isotope of hydrogen in it. And then we say, oh, I don't care about the difference between water and heavy water. I would like to simplify my model. Then you can do that with a morphism of Petri nets where you just identify those two forms of water with a single, with a single thing, water, and these two transitions with a single transition. But another thing you want to do besides simplifying models is you want to make models more complicated. So if you had some model of some process and you wanted to throw in some extra complications, throw in some extra transitions and, and uh, places, you, could, you can do that as well. So this morphism is doing a bit of both. So it's a pretty useful concept in short, if you, if you think Petri nets are useful in the first place. Um, there's also a category of commutative monoidal categories. And if you're well versed in the doctrine of uh, internalization, it's just the obvious thing. Namely, it's the <laughs> category of categories internal to the category of commutative monoidal categories. But you'll notice that that sentence contained the word category four times in quick succession. So only category theorists can stand such sentences. Um, so <clears throat> a slightly different way to say the same thing that takes longer is that the objects here are going to be your commutative monoidal categories <clears throat> and the morphisms are going to be strict monoidal functors and then it turns out that those are automatically going to be symmetric monoidal functors in this case uh, so you can just say strict monoidal functors if you want um, so that so in other words they preserve everything that, you, that your commutative monoidal category has on the nose, no, no funny business. Um, and so there's indeed an adjunction between the category of Petri nets and the category of commutative monoidal categories, where the left adjoint is what I already described, sends a Petri net to this free commutative monoidal category on it. Um, it, it, the theorem's a little harder to prove than we thought. So Jade and I were working on it, and we discovered that in addition to something called the right adjoint, there's something else called the wrong adjoint. So I, you may never heard of wrong adjoints, but um, the, there was a there was some functor that we thought was the right adjoint, um, and it obeyed all the properties that a right adjoint should, except that the bijection of Hom sets that's supposed to occur when you have an adjunction was not natural. Um, so usually when you get to the point of checking an adjunction, as soon as you get that, you know, Hom of left adjoint, blah, 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 is isomorphic to Hom of right adjoint, blah, 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 you say like, oh yes, we've got it. <clears throat> it's bound to be natural because everything we did felt natural. Um, but, but in fact, in this case, <clears throat> that, that part failed. And then Mike Shulman helped save us and gave us the, the right adjoint. Um, so, and that uh, was generalized by Jade <coughs> in this paper down here at the bottom. So you'll notice that what I'm <coughs> doing here is using this free commutative monoid concept 
in a couple of places, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and for example, here, these are categories in uh, the category of commutative monoids. And, and PetriNet also had a free commutative mo uh, monoid lurking in it. Um, and so Jay generalized this whole story by replacing commutative monoid by anything that you can describe with a Levere theory. <clears throat> so for any Levere theory, there's some kind of generalization of the concept of PetriNet and all this stuff I've described and all sorts of other stuff uh, generalizes to that case. But anyway, let's stick with plain old PetriNet. So the point is that this functor sending any PetriNet to its uh, commutative monoidal category provides what some computer scientists might call an operational semantics for Petri nets. That is, it describes a Petri net's behavior, what it, what it does. And so what I wanna talk about is, can we make this operational semantics be compositional? So compositionality is a big theme in applied category theory. The, it's the idea that you can, it's nice when you can systematically describe the behavior of a big complicated thing from describing the behavior of its parts and having a really good systematic way of understanding how to, how to put together parts. And so we can <clears throat> build Petri nets from parts. So there's a concept of an open Petri net, which will be, I'll say it more in a minute later, but, but it's basically a, a Petri net that is equipped with two sets, a set of inputs and a set of so the, those are these sets A with three elements and B with one element, and maps from those sets to the set of uh, places of your Petri net. So these, these inputs here are getting mapped to these places as shown, and this one happens to get mapped to that one there. And, and then the point is that from these open, these open Petri nets, we can stick them together and build larger Petri nets from them. And so the question is, can you compute a Petri net's behavior? That is, it's, uh, it's the commutative monoidal category you get from it, from the behavior of its pieces. So the answer is gonna be yes. Um, so see, open Petri nets are morphisms in a category. You can compose open Petri nets. I can have an open Petri net here going from A to B, and I have another one here going from B to C, and then I can compose them by sticking them together where I just use the fact that um, I've got two maps from the set B, one into the places of our first Petri net, one into the places of our second Petri net, and we just identify a place of the first or the place of the second whenever they're both pointed to from the same uh, dot in B. So we stick these two yellow circles together and get this one. So as you can see, that's a kind of push out going on. Um, so it can compose them, but also you can tensor open Petri nets. If I have an open Petri net going from A to B and another one going from A prime to B prime, I can just set them side by side as, as shown here and get a Petri net going from the uh, disjoint union A plus A prime to the disjoint union B plus B prime. So, it looks like we're getting a symmetric monoidal category of open Petri nets. So I should just point out that we're doing something sort of fun here. We have symmetric monoidal categories showing up in two roles in this game, and you have to not let that confuse you. Um, so every Petri net gives you a symmetric monoidal category, actually a commutative monoidal category. But now we're talking about something different, namely that there is a symmetric monoidal category of open Petri nets, that is having open Petri nets as morphisms. And we, we wanna think about both of these things at once in a minute. <laughs> so, but right now I'm emphasizing that there's a symmetric monoidal category with open Petri nets as morphisms. Well, that's not quite true, but it's almost true. Um, the problem is that composition, as I've described it, isn't associative. It's just associative up to 
isomorphism. So there are, the point is that there are morphisms between open Petri nets. Um, so for example, here's a sort of interesting two, well, because Petri nets are gonna be morphisms already, these things are gonna call, be called two morphisms. And there's a two morphism, for example, from this open Petri net to this one, where I'm, for example, mapping these two places down to this, mapping these two transitions down to this, mapping this one down to here. And well, these ones aren't getting hit by the two morphism. So the, there are two morphisms between them. The simplest ones are the isomorphisms where you're just sort of rearranging things. And composition of own open Petri nets is only gonna be associative up to two isomorphism. I mean, that should have been clear if you thought carefully about what's going on with composition here, which is that it's a push out and push outs are only defined up to isomorphism. So there's no way to expect that composition is associative on the nose, unless you pull some trick like working with isomorphism classes of open Petri nets, but it's gonna be associative up to isomorphism. So we're getting pulled into some higher categories here, namely slightly higher, two categories or something like that. Turns out we really wanna use double categories. So there's gonna be a symmetric monoidal double category with open Petri nets as the horizontal morphisms, which I'll call horizontal one cells. So a double category, which I talked about a bunch more in my uh, first talk, so I'll just zip through it now, just a rough sketch of the idea. It's gonna have figures like this. It'll have objects, which are these capital letters. It'll have vertical one morphisms, such as these F and G. It'll have horizontal one cells. I'll call them one cells to help distinguish them <laughs> from the vertical things. Uh, such as M and N, and then two morphisms, which are filling in the squares. And you can compose them in various visually evident ways. In particular, the two morphisms, you can compose both vertically and also horizontally. And you have this law that says that if I vertically compose these two, vertically compose these two, and then horizontally compose the result, it's the same as if I horizontally compose these two, horizontally compose these two and vertically compose the result. So that's the, called the interchange law. And we're gonna be working with what used to be called pseudo double categories, but now I think we just call them double categories, where vertical composition is strictly associative and unital, but the horizontal composition is only weakly. So, so Mike Shulman has some very nice papers on, on double categories that explain all this story in detail. Um, and so Jade and I constructed a symmetric monoidal double category with open Petri nets as the horizontal one morphisms. And to do that, we used this theory of structured co-spans that Kenny and I invented, which you can read about in our paper and also Kenny's thesis, which has a lot more detail. And you should like his thesis so much that you instantly hire him and he'll be flooded with job offers tomorrow, I'm sure. So what's a structured co-span? Well, if you, whenever you have a functor from one category to another, you can make a kind of co-span whose feet morally live in the first category and whose apex is an object in the second category. Of course, a diagram has to live in one category or another. So we take the, the feet, the objects A and B of our category A, and we hit it with L to put, push them over into the category X. And then we have a co-span in there. So, so the idea is that in our example um, of the Petri nets, um, we're, we're going to have the, the feet of the co-span be sets and the apex be a Petri net. And so then a structured co-span would be an open Petri net where you have a Petri net, but then with maps from sets into it, or more precisely, maps from sets into its set of uh, places, as I showed in a few slides ago. 
So this theory of structured cospans is very general and very simple and nice. So whenever you have two categories, A and X, that have finite colimits and you have a left adjoint functor, you get a symmetric monoidal double category of these structured cospans. So the horizontal one cells will be structured cospans, more precisely. The objects will be those of A. The vertical morphisms will be morphisms in A. The horizontal one cells will be structured cospans. And then the two morphisms will be maps of structured cospans. So we have a structured cospan here on top and one on the bottom, and then some vertical stuff going from the top to the bottom, where notice F and G are morphisms in A, so they really are vertical one morphisms, and H is a morphism in X. And so that's, that's a nice theorem. And the way it works is that you can horizontally compose these uh, two morphisms using a, using a push out. So we, 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 we stick X and Y together by doing a push out over L, B here, similarly down below. Vertical composition is just straightforward because you just have morphisms going straight down here, and so those are easy to compose just directly. Uh, and then we have a tensor product in our symmetric monoidal, in our symmetric uh, monoidal double category, which is just coming from coproducts. We've got coproducts in both A and in X, and so we can just use those to stick together to of these guys. And then we need the fact that L preserves coproducts to get to get this to be well defined. So this guy here is isomorphic in a canonical way to L of A1 plus L of A2. So it gets a morphism to X1 plus X1 prime. Sorry, L of A1 plus L of A1 prime maps to this. So it's all pretty natural. So what we're going to do is apply this theory to the case of this left adjoint functor. L from sets to Petri, from set to Petri, which maps any set to the Petri net with that set of places and no transitions at all. So if we use that choice of L, then a structured cospan looks just like and is an open Petri net. So here A and B are sets. This is our Petri net. And then we have maps from the from L of A and L of B into our Petri net. And the category of sets and the category of Petri have all co-limits, in fact. And so we get a symmetric monoidal double category using that theorem. And I'll call it open Petri. There's a fun funky O here that's sort of doubled looking to let you know it's a double category uh, with open Petri nets as the horizontal one morphisms. So, what I want to do is describe the semantics for open Petri nets now. And to do that, we'll play a, a game like this. We have a way to turn any Petri net into a commutative monoidal category. And that functor there is a left adjoint. So I can compose these two left adjoints. And I get a left adjoint, which I'll call L prime, going from sets to commutative monoidal categories. This left adjoint here, using the same big theorem that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, gives us symmetric monoidal double category as well. So this would be the symmetric monoidal double category of open commutative monoidal categories. So those would be the horizontal one cells. So that, that this is a double category where a horizontal one cell will have a will go from some set to a set, <clears throat> and in the middle there'll be a commutative monoidal category. And there'll be maps from these sets into its set of objects, in, into the underlying set of its commutative monoidal category of objects. Um, and so the nice thing is that <clears throat> there's a kind of functoriality of the construction in the previous theorem, <clears throat> which is that if we've got We've already seen that if you have one left adjoint where the, all the categories around have finite co-limits, 
then you get a symmetric monoidal double category from it. Well, now here we have another one. Uh, so we get another symmetric monoidal double category from it. And now the theorem here says that, well, from this data, we also get a symmetric monoidal double functor, that is a map between symmetric monoidal double categories going from the first one to the second one when we have this commuting triangle here. And it just does the sort of obvious thing that is a two morphism in the first double category is a guy like this. <clears throat> and we just map it over to a two morphism in our second double category where it looks like this, where we've just replaced all the L's with the L primes and where all the uh, objects X, which were up here in the category X are getting mapped to objects in X prime. Those of you who have a high, highly developed sense of these things will wonder why I drew a triangle and not a square. Why didn't I also change A to A prime? And the answer is, well, just because I didn't need to right now, but we could do that. And some of you may ask, why did this triangle have to commute? Why couldn't it just commute up to natural isomorphism? And the answer is, sure, it can commute up to natural isomorphism. That's fine too. But since in our example, we built this functor L prime just to be the composite of these two, I didn't want to tell you about that fancier theorem just now. So, so what we get out, out of this in our example is that we get, um, so remember our example is that we have a way to turn sets into Petri nets, in very boring Petri nets with no transitions, just places. We have a way to turn Petri nets into commutative monoidal categories. And so then we can compose those. And so we get a symmetric monoidal double functor that takes open Petri nets to open commutative monoidal categories. So this is what says that the operational semantics of Petri nets is compositional. That is, uh, we can take some open Petri nets and compose them and then turn them into open commutative monoidal categories or the other way around and we get isomorphic answers so that we can compute the behavior of a big complicated open Petri net if we know the behavior of all its pieces. So any, any Petri net can be thought of as being built up by sticking together lots of little open Petri nets. So, so any Petri net its behavior can be computed compositionally in this way. Um, so there are actually a number of different forms of semantics for open Petri nets. Uh, besides this operational semantics, where you get a category that says how the Petri net behaves, there's also another kind of semantics that's usually called the reachability semantics, which just says what they can accomplish not how they do it, but just what they do, what they, what they achieve in the end. Uh, so there are actually now two approaches to this, and I'll present one that's not in the paper with Jade, because uh, it's quicker. And so I mentioned this concept of reachability a little while ago, well, a while ago. <laughs> so if you've got two different markings of a Petri net, you can say that the second one is reachable from the first, if there's a morphism in the free commutative monoidal category on the Petri net going from the first to the second. Or in other words, if there's a sequence of transitions that, that goes from the first marking to the second. In this particular example, you'll notice there are actually a number of different ways to get from this marking to this marking. Uh, so you notice going from here to here, one black dot has moved over to the right, but you can't actually see from the picture whether this black dot used this transition to get there or whether it used this transition to get there. So the picture is not actually telling you what this morphism is. There are two different morphisms it could be. Um, and then similarly, in the second step, I'm not telling you which way this dot went from, the second dot went from left to right. So there are various morphisms 
NFP that go from this object to this object. Maybe if you want a, a, a riddle to uh, check your understanding of everything, you can ask how many morphisms are there from this to this. You might think that there would be two times two, i.e. four, because each dot has two choices of how it gets from here to there. But I'll tell you the answer is not four. There are not four different morphisms from here to here. So if you want to think about something, you can think about that. But the point is that there's more than one. So there's more than one way to get from here to there. And in the operational semantics, each of those morphisms counts as a different thing. We really care how the process happens. But the concept of reachability doesn't care. It just says, can you get from here to there? Uh, that's a, a cr sort of cruder approach to life where you don't ask people how they're doing something that you just want to know if they can do it. Um, and so remember that if I, we have a Petri net, it will have this set of markings, the free commutative monoid on the set of uh, places. And this becomes a post set where we say that X is less, a marking X is less than or equal to a marking Y if Y is reachable from X. So the, the Petri net gives the set of markings with the structure of a, of a post set. And it's actually better than that because the set of markings is a commutative monoid as well. Uh, you can add markings and we get a commutative monoidal post set because if it, Y is reachable from X and Y prime is reachable from X prime, then the Y plus Y prime is reachable from X plus X prime. So for many Petri net, you can uh, get your hands on this commutative monoidal post set. And what we're really doing here is we're taking that commutative monoidal category that I've been talking about repeatedly that you get out of a Petri net and just sort of squashing it down to a post set. But it's going to be a commutative monoidal post set. So there's a category, CMP, of commutative monoidal post sets and order preserving uh, monoid homomorphisms. And there's a forgetful functor from commutative monoidal posets to commutative monoidal categories, because a poset's a special sort of category, basically. Uh, and that has a left edge joint, which is what you can do to take a commutative monoidal category and squash it down to a commutative monoidal poset, where you say that one object is less than or equal to the other if there exists a morphism from, from uh, the first to the second. So that's a left adjoint, this G here. So we can play the same trick that I did before and get yet another uh, map of symmetric monoidal double categories uh, using that big second big theorem I mentioned, big just in the sense that it takes up a whole slide, not that it's so profound or anything. Uh, and so we can now go from open Petri nets first to open commutative monoidal categories. That's this operational semantics that I talked about at first, but then squash them down to open commutative monoidal posets and get the get a reachability semantics for uh, open Petri nets. Um, so in short, here's the summary of what I've said, the executive summary. Uh, I guess executives are people that are so, like, so busy that they can't ever read anything in detail, I guess. So if you're an executive, you can tune in just now. So the executive summary is each Petri net gives a commutative monoidal category. And there's also a symmetric monoidal double category of open Petri nets. And then if you combine these ideas, you get this operational semantics for open Petri nets. And then if you turn commutative monoidal categories into commutative monoidal posets, we get a reachability semantics for open Petri nets. So I like this a lot because it's really, really a playground of pretty simple categorical ideas connected to monoids. <clears throat> and that's sort of what you'd expect or hope for when you're trying to come up with a theory that's like a very simple theory of what 
of what processes can be. So Petri nets have long been interesting to computer scientists as like a simple playground for studying questions in what distributed computation can do. And it shouldn't be surprising that it boils down into a bunch of category theory like this if you want it to. Um, so some of you know already that there's a company called Statebox that's uh, really building software for industrial purposes using Petri nets and they're hiring category theorists to, uh, to work on it. And so there really is some chance now that we could use some of this type of theory that I'm describing here and related theory to, uh, to really make, make industrial processes simpler and clearer and being, being able to reason about it with the help of category theory. So although this stuff I'm presenting here is not applied yet, I think it could be applied. And so I'm looking forward to seeing it uh, get applied. Okay, thanks. I think I'm done. Thank you so much, John. Uh, thanks for a sure. nice talk. So I think there's already a question appearing in the chat. So people are asking whether this example of uh, these different morphisms that you gave when you started talking about reachability. So can you maybe go back there? Ah, uh, sorry, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. You mean this? There, yeah. People are, uh, are asking whether the answer is yes, three, three because of the ability of Excellent, it's three. So the reason it's three is that, well, right, so there's an upper bound of four <laughs> because each dot here has, has two choices of how to get from here to there. However, the morphism where first, this dot goes, Let's see. Let's see if I can remember why it's three. Why is it three? I'm getting uh, confused. People are asking if it's because these tokens are indistinguishable. Yeah, it's definitely so connected. One to the left and one are... right is the same as one right and one left, I guess. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, so, so both guys can go on on the top route, both guys can go on the bottom route. And then there's a third possibility, which is that one of them goes on the top route and one of them goes on the bottom route, but but it doesn't matter who's who. They're indistinguishable. So you don't really get to say which one went the top route and which one went the bottom route. Yeah, so this idea that they're indistinguishable is um, sometimes called the uh, collective token philosophy, meaning that there's just a natural number of these black dots in each place. There's not a finite set of these black dots in each place. And so the permuting them has no meaning. And that's connected to the why, how, why we're using commutative monoidal categories instead of symmetric monoidal categories. Now, there are people who don't like that. You might want to use what they call the individual token philosophy, where each black dot has its own individuality, and so it means something to permute them. And that's, that's fine. That would be a more complicated and also potentially more powerful approach to, to thinking about Petri nets, but it, it hasn't been worked out quite as beautifully yet. Let's just put it that way. Um, I think you need something more than a Petri net as described in these slides to really uh, implement the individual token philosophy. And there's a buzzword called pre-nets, which is a buzzword for the uh, type of generalization of Petri net you need to treat the uh, uh, individual token philosophy. And in Jade's paper on generalized Petri nets, she talks about that as well. But I would like to see a bit more work on that to make it really clear. I see, thanks. So there's yep. a couple more questions. So I encourage uh, the audience to ask the questions in the Zulip channel because some questions may require a long answer or long discussions. So it's better if they stay there, uh, even for after a talk. So please use Zulip if you can. So anyway, so first maybe a question that's still related to what you just said. So someone is asking, this is like bosonic particles, or, uh, I suppose tokens. So is there a fermionic analog? So maybe this is related to what you just said, like individuality. Um, 
it's uh well act, so fermions would not allow you to have more than one token in each place there is a fermionic analog but i'm not but but it's um it's it's sort of a different kind of thing there so there instead of commutative monoids sorry uh, th there is a fermionic analog um but it's probably not something that people think about quite so much. They'd be called one bounded Petri nets and that they would be um, Petri nets where when you actually use them, you can put at most one token in any place. Um, there are three kinds of what they're called, they're called statistics in physics. They're, there's bosons, there's fermions, and there's a third one called the few people called Boltzons, named after Boltzmann. Uh, so Boltzmann was studying classical uh, particles. And in classical particles, you can have a situation where you could, or at least they thought you could have the situation where you ha could have particles that are in this, that are all the same, but the process of switching them really does have an effect. Whereas with bosons, if you switch two bosons in the same state, it has no effect. It acts as the identity morphism. That's what we're dealing with here. Um, so, but I th so I think actually the, uh, the uh, really interesting question is not the fermionic ones of these, but the the, the Boltzmann statistics ones, where that is where we're switching to tokens uh, has an effect. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So another question, somebody is asking. I would like to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, okay, just a second, yes. So there's a question that says, um, how does this behave with different notions of rewriting? Thinking particularly about the ones developed by Fabio Zanazzi and Filippo Bonchi. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's the short answer. And it's also the long answer in this case. <laughs> to this question. I see. If, you, uh, if, you're, someone, like, if someone on Zulip told, why, how about on Zulip, you uh, expound on that question a little bit more so that I can get my teeth into it a bit better. Yeah. Okay, uh, Joachim, you have a, a question? Uh, yes, I would like to know how you choose um, the input and output things of a petri net <clears throat> um they are they are completely arbitrary so so one one danger with drawing these beautiful pictures is that it looks like oh the inputs have to be over on the left and the outputs have to be over on the right or something like that so but but in fact these maps from from finite from a finite set into the set of places. It could be just any map whatsoever. So I could have like had an arrow going to every single uh, place if I'd wanted to. So, the, but the, the, so, so what's the point of them then you could say? Well, the point of them is that I, I use those maps when I'm, when I'm gonna be composing open Petri nets. So the idea is that if I, if I have two Petri nets, and I want to compose them by sticking this thing, identifying this with this, then I'd better make those open, make those Petri nets into open Petri nets in such a way that, that uh, the target of one ha looks like this and the source of the one, that one looks like this so that I stick them together here. I don't know if that helps or not. Uh, well, yes, but I still, for example, here's a question. Uh, suppose you have some petri nets where you have no loops so that in a given state you can only run a few steps uh -huh. and then you start to glue them together so that suddenly you have a, a cycle so that you can run forever how, how is that compatible with what you said that um, this free symmetric model category semantics preserves um, well uh -huh. it? yeah it's it's yeah that's a good question it's because when we when we are gluing together commutative monoidal categories i don't know if i'm going to find the perfect slide for myself here but um so 
So I'm saying that you can glue together open tetra nets and turn them into a commutative monoidal category or turn each one into a commutative monoidal category and then glue them together. So that process of gluing together commutative monoidal categories can be very productive when you glue two together in such a way that one of them has a morphism going from say X to Y and the other one has a morphism going from Y to X. When you glue them together, you're doing a push out in the world of commutative monoidal categories. And so now you get a category that has all these powers of, or all those composites where you go back and forth arbitrarily many times. Okay. Yeah. Hey John, I have a, I have a question. Um, sure. I, I really enjoyed uh, your talk. It's, I mean, it's really uh, wonderful to see how things work uh, nicely. Um, I was wondering uh, uh, two things, uh, basically two questions. So the first one is, uh, do you have also a structured span? Do you also have a nice, uh, nice uh, structure? And uh, if this is the case, can you see a PetriNet as a, a structured span for, uh, for the, the functor N? For the functor which? The functor N. A PetriNet is a span, right? Yeah. And it's a, stru it's a structured span, I would say. Oh, oh, oh. Um, okay, finally, I see. I don't know if they have good property, this is a structured span. Um, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, so, sorry, I'm just, yeah, so, right. So you're saying that that there, that picture on top, you can think of it as a structured uh, endo. Span. Sorry, I'm just wrapping my head around it. That's a, sorry, that's a structured co-span, right? It's, it's, let's see, I can think of this in two different ways. <laughs> to make this into a span or a co-span, I have to break apart one of the objects and think of it as showing up twice, right? So, um, so no, I mean, S and T are the leg of the span. Sorry? S and T are the leg of the span. Right, but, and you can think of it that way where you take this N of S and you draw it twice and you now think of it as a, as a span. I'm just noticing now that I could also taken this object T and broken it apart and think of the S and T as going from two copies of this to N of S and then it would be a cosine. Yeah, but I think he <laughs> thinks of it as a span because of the way they compose. That's similar to how spans compose, right? How, you, how do you compose? I have no idea. <laughs> um, anyway, I don't really, I don't, yeah. I'm, uh, so normally when I've thought about structured spans, I so far just formally uh, take the theory of structured cospans and reuse it where I take both categories in question as the opposite of some other category. So sp spans in some category or cospans in the opposite category. Okay. Um, and so that, that's one thing you can do and you can quickly get a whole theory of, of structured spans for no extra money, okay. no extra charge. Um, that may not ma manage to do everything you want. Um, Right. I'll need to think about that question more. So, right. Yeah. So, so, okay. So one thing you're saying, one thing you're sort of alluding to is that you can think of a category as a monad in spans of sets. Yes. Yes. That's what I was thinking. And then, and so like one thing you could try to do is, is think about a monad in structured spans, for example. Yes. And see what see what you get. Um, I I have a feel. I don't. Yeah. So I don't really have a good answer to this. I. That, um, it reminds me of ideas like T multi category or also poly category <laughs> uh, where you you 
take the concept of category and you you stick a monad <laughs> in there in such a way that like instead of just having morphisms from a, from objects to objects you get a morphism from collections of objects a collection of objects to an object uh, or from a collection of objects to another collection of objects um, so I think that if I dig in the direction you're pointing, I will wind up getting the, there. Uh, okay. and, and another question uh, is... Uh, so, sorry, let's let Todd say something. I think he's, he's pretty good. Oh, I oh, he's going to say something good. <laughs> uh, just in reference to the last question or comment, uh, there, there might be a difficulty with the fact that the free commutative monoid monad is not Cartesian, which is you know a nice thing that you often want in this scenario when you're trying to compose spans and look at m monads in those structured spans. Right. So in this theory of prenets that I was vaguely alluding to, you replace the uh, commutative monoids by just plain old monoids. Yeah. So so then you would be a, then you'd then you'd get a Cartesian monad and things would, right. some things would work better, yeah. Um, there was another, you had another question? I can't yes. see this questioner, by the way, that who's talking to me now, but anyway, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So, uh, the, the second question is um, whether you can also reuse exactly the same framework up to, I mean, not the reachability, which is something very nice, but uh, exactly the same categorical framework to compose uh, uh, Petri nets which are open on transitions and not on place. Sometimes it's interesting to compose uh, Petri nets on transition because allow you to synchronize them. And uh, from what you said, I have the feeling that uh, you can do exactly the same way. I haven't done that. I would like to do that. I right. So when people compose Petri nets by by making them share transitions. They use the term synchronizing transitions. Yeah. And I get very, I tend to get very confused um, because you really want to do things a little bit differently there. Um, you want to make it be that you like had one transition that made a bunch of stuff turn into a bunch of stuff, and another transition that made a bunch of stuff turn into a bunch of stuff, and you want to stick them together. And I think you want to make this new glued together transition simultaneously do this, turn this stuff into this stuff, and also to turn this stuff into this stuff. I, that's my best impression of what synchronizing transitions is. I'm, I, I'm sure. So, um, so basically, I've been sort of a little bit intimidated by this concept for some reason, but uh, but I do want to get into it. And I think that there should be some way to adapt this framework to, to handle that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure, that's a good, good nudge. I, 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 yeah, I'm really mainly hoping I can get Jade to do that, <laughs> to, to handle this gluing together Petri nets on transitions, because she's sort of more into the Petri net literature than I am. So I have a yeah, so the the first thing you can do for that is you can oh, just allow them to be any Petri nets on the feet. Um, and then uh, that's like a somewhat idea of doing it. But the problem is that in order to get uh, matching co-spans like that, you're already having the Petri nets sort of simulate each other to begin with. So it's sort of too strict of a condition that most people want when they glue transitions. But that's one way to think about it is just having general co-spans of Petri nets that you glue together via push out. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So that's that's so right. So one simple thing you could do is say, forget this structured co-span business where we're just gluing together petri nets only by attaching some some uh places to some places. Just use co-spans in the category of petri nets and just let yourself glue petri nets to form larger petri nets however the heck you you want. But but I guess as Jay just said, that's a little bit too wild and undisciplined for 
what people normally want to do. Thank you. I have an offhand question. Um, so I, there are certain scenarios in which you might be able to describe by categories of structured co-spans by some suitable universal property. And I was wondering if there was a universal property which would be germane to uh, the Petri net structured co-spans. Um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure I know what you mean, but I'll, I'll just guess. So, um, so uh, just to give a different kind of example, uh, I think there's a, a universal way of describing, for example, the by category of correlations or something like that. So it's the universe is the walking by category with such instruction, such uh, um, by algebra or however, however it goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's what I was hoping. <laughs> that's what I was guessing is that type of thing. Um, right. So one project that I've been trying to get Jade to do is to do that for the, so if you take the, so if you take this symmetric monoidal double category of open Petri nets and you decategorify it one notch down to a symmetric monoidal category of, of isomorphism classes of open Petri nets. So you can think of that symmetric monoidal category as a prop because the objects are just the different kind of objects are just how many uh, places you have. So the objects you can just think of as natural numbers. And so then you can ask, what is that the prop for? Just like you can ask, what is, take correlations and turn it into a prop or take relations and turn it into a prop and ask what's that the prop for? And I guess I'll, since I've given away the problem now, which is the fun part, I guess I should give away my guess of the answer, which is that it should be, Something like the prop for an object with a whole bunch of operations on it, uh, which are for every pair of natural numbers, an operation having n inputs and m outputs. All of these operations being commutative in the sense that permuting the inputs and the outputs do doesn't affect them, but having no further relations. So the point of all that baloney is that if you like look at PetriNet, they're able to have transitions with any number of inputs and any number of outputs. And so in this prop I'm talking about, the, those transitions would be the generating morphisms. And so they would be these uh, things I'm talking about that have any number of inputs and any number of outputs and no interesting relations on them, except for the fact that they're commutative with respect to permuting inputs and outputs. So anyway, I don't know if that made any sense, but, but, I, but I do think there's an answer to that. And I think it would be a, a uh, a good thing to know because then at least at this category level you'd have another way to think about what it is you're doing when you're mapping the well it, it, would, it would describe like sort of all possible semantics for open petri nets because you'd say oh, the, the symmetric monoidal category of open petri nets is the prop for Blotty blahs. And so a choice of semantics for open petri nets is just a choice of blotty blah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so Simon Willerton has his hand raised. Simon, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, it's a quite a basic question, actually. Um, so the category associated with petri net, so the, you say that the morphisms are generated by the transitions, but you're saying they're not freely generated by the transitions. Um, they write because, well, because 
because we're aiming for a commutative monoidal category. But, 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 but I'm not even talking, uh, uh, even before the monoidal structures involved. Sorry, it's, I mean, so the only category that I'm ever interested in that's generated by a Petrinet is this commutative monoidal category that you get. Yeah. So, so I could, I could be interested in, in other ones. <laughs> so, so I, I could be, I could be interested in other ones that have fewer relations, but, um, but, but because I'm interested in this commutative monoidal one, it, it, it that, the fact that it's commutative monoidal forces certain forces certain relations. I'm not sure I'm quite getting your question. Right. Maybe I have an answer. Um, I think if you only generate by composing these um, transitions, then you get things where you can uh, detect if you first do A and then B, or you first do B and then A in some remote right. regions of the Petri net. So when you impose these monoidal conditions, you divide out by that, I think. So that's, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So if you don't do that, you get, instead of having, so these things you generate are like processes, but if you keep, if you don't divide out for this last relation, you are generating runs, meaning that you know which takes place in which order. So you can only trick one transition at a time. Yeah, so that, so I guess I, I was thinking of this as sort of taking this category of, of, uh, of uh, comp composing transitions and then saying that's got a monoidal structure on it and that's the wrong, wrong way of thinking about it. Yeah, so you're taking this thing and then you're imposing some relations which gives you this mono a commutative monoidal structure on it. Yeah, that's right. So an example of the thing that's, that Joachim was just mentioning is this one here. So yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, that, yeah. yeah that, first just, do this. Yeah. And then do this and one the other way, um, but in my commutative monoidal category, I'm the the interchange law makes those be equal. The interchange law of preferred composition and tensor product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Very good. So there are some more questions on Zolip. So somebody is asking. Is there a nice generalization of Petri nets where the reachability problem is harder than the halting problem? I was wondering if giving the tokens individuality might do it. I don't know about that. That's a good question. I do not know how it changes if you think about that. Um, so there are some computer scientists, of course, who are never happy with anything until it's as powerful as a universal Turing machine. So there are people who take Petri nets and soup them up in various ways to give them more computational power. And so the, the usual way that people do that is they talk about Petri, Petri nets with guards, one, one of the usual ways. And so the idea of guards is that you could, well, I guess, I'm sorry, they, they're called colored Petri nets with guards. So one thing you can do is you can give your tokens different colors. I'll sketch the idea very sketchily, so it's a little bit complicated. You can give the tokens different colors, and then you can say that a tr certain transition can fire only if some condition holds on the colors of the tokens that would go in there. So it can say like, I'm only gonna fire if a red token comes in. It's a little bit more interesting when several tokens are coming in. So then you can say, like, I'm only going to fire if there's like one red and two greens. So you, so now you have like little Boolean operations uh, involved in describing which, uh, under which conditions a, a transition will fire, and that makes Petri nets more complicated. And I, and some. Thing along those lines, I'm not, I'm forgetting the exact result, make, pushes them over the brink into being computationally universal. 
I'm fascinated okay. by things that aren't computationally universal uh, because the questions about them are decidable. And so I, I like the idea of, of Petri nets being sort of on the brink of being computationally universal, but not quite. And I would like to explore that more. Thanks. So uh, there's a question. Uh, what's an example application of Petri nets to understand something that otherwise would be cumbersome to analyze? Okay. So I happen to have a book on that. So, <laughs> and it's free though, so I'm not trying to sell it. Um, so it's, it's called, um, well, it has a funny name. It's called Quantum Techniques in Stochastic Mechanics. And it's, a lot of it's about Petri nets. And in, in chemistry, people have used Petri nets under the name of reaction networks. And they actually draw them differently. So they're technically different, but they're isomorphic. Any Petri net gives you a reaction network and vice versa. And these chemists have this way of taking a reaction network and if all the transitions are labeled with some numbers called the rates of those transitions, they get a set of differential equations out, which actually I talked about in my last talk on this stuff. And, and those differential equations describe the dynamics of the chemical system, how the rate at which chemicals turn into other chemicals. And these chemists have proved some nice theorems about the qualitative properties of these differential equations, like is there a unique steady state and things like that. And they've proved these theorems where the hypotheses on the theorems only involve the of the reaction network, not the actual values of the rate constants. So just look at a reaction network, and if you're lucky, you can draw a bunch of conclusions about the qualitative dynamics of a chemical system. And so I think that's the, the best, uh, one of the best answers to your question, at least the best one that I know, where if you didn't use this method, you just would be faced with some big fat set of differential equations and having to try to study its, its dynamics as best you could, <laughs> but, but using the more graphical the diagrammatic approach, you, you can often resolve problems quite efficiently. Thanks. It's very good to know that in other disciplines, they have come up with, uh, with the same idea pretty much uh, under a different name. That's very cool. So a comment, uh, so some, Ralph was asking something about rewriting. So Joe Muller is saying that it might be worth looking at Daniel Chikala's thesis, which is linked in the Zulip channel, if you're interested. Yeah, so he wrote it. Then we have another. Yeah, so he wrote a thesis on Sorry. on uh, using structured cospans as part of uh, rewriting theory. So for things like rewriting graphs, that's the most famous example. You could try to think about rewriting open graphs. So uh, and then you're blending rewriting theory with structured cospans, and that's what he did. Okay, then there's a question that's actually been discussed quite a lot already in the Zulip channel. Uh, but me, you may want to say something about it. So uh, if you use free monoids on R, real numbers, as opposed to N, what do you get? Has it something to do with Petri nets with rates? Okay, so free R modules instead of N modules, I think he means, yeah. Um, that doesn't so much have to do with rates. That would just have to do with saying that instead of a natural number of tokens in a place, you just have a real number, maybe a non-negative real number, uh, for example. And then you could have transitions that would, you know, be more like in a recipe where they say like you need two teaspoons of sugar and one and a half teaspoons of salt and so on, and then you can bake a cake. Um, so, so I think it would be something like that, that uh, describing processes where you can use non 
integral amounts of stuff to create other stuff. I should say that another thing is that um, Fabrizio Genovese and Yella Harold have looked at the case where you use uh, not natural numbers, but integers. And so then you get negative amounts of things as, as possible ingredients to your recipe. And um, I've never seen a recipe that uses negative three eggs or something like that, but, but he, they call them lending nets where you could imagine like you have processes that, I, I guess financial transactions might be modeled by that. So you know that it was bankers who invented negative numbers. It was Venetian bankers who invented numbers written in red to indicate debts. And that was the first use of negative numbers. So, so it's really these nasty bankers in the finance industry. They invented negative numbers so that you could go into debt. It's, it's an amazing tour, the force of abstraction. And so mathematicians were drawn into it reluctantly. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but so you could, so there's a theory of these lending nets where I, I guess the idea is that you could say like, well, I don't have this, but you know, like, I, I can borrow it and be in debt or something like that. I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but it's a, that's an, another interesting generalization. Thank you. Okay, new question. Is there a disjointness requirement on the inputs and outputs? It's harder to picture if they're not disjoint. It's harder to picture if they're not disjoint, but there's no, there's definitely no requirements imposed other than what I s said. So, and, and in my talk last week, I did an example of a Petri net where, where, the, where for a disease model where a susceptible person and an infected person can go into the transition and then two uh, infected people come out. So the inf infected is both appearing as a uh, source of the transition and as a target of the transition. So that we definitely want to allow that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there's actually way more questions on the Zulip channel and maybe let's have a last one online. Sure. Uh, so is there a relationship between the behavioral or operational semantics described and the gray boxing functor from open petronets with rates to dynamical systems, even though there's a discrete continuous mismatch going on? Right, so, so just for people who don't know what gray boxing is, so, so in a paper with Blake Pollard, we were studying the Petri nets with rates, that is where they're real, positive real numbers attached to the transitions. And there you get differential equations out of the Petri nets with rates. And that process of extracting the differential equation from the Petri net with rates can be described as a kind of functor. Uh, and we call that gray boxing because black boxing is a term used to where you have an open system and you encase it in a black box and all you understand now is the relationship between the inputs and the outputs. But this is some less uh, opaque form of box where you, you ignore the, some of the details of your system but you still keep track of the differential equation described in the system. So stuff moving around still affect, you still see after you gray box it. Um, so anyway, their time is very important. So we, we have a, like a, a, a process occurring over, over time. Here in these Petri nets, the way I'm describing them right now, their time has played no role at all. So Joachim mentioned some kind of approach where you think about what he called a run of your Petri net, where you, you can imagine it maybe occurring in discrete time where at each time step, one transition can fire. And so you could imagine a semantics for open Petri nets that was a run semantics that kept track of things in time. It would 
probably want to be a non-deterministic semantics because there are many transitions that can fire at a given time and you uh, so it won't it won't be like a differential equation which is describing different uh, deterministic dynamics it would be a possibilistic or non-deterministic semantics uh, so I, anyway I haven't worked out any of those those things but I think that would be a really interesting thing to to explore so I feel yeah so I feel like I've tried a few different kinds of things and then there's a kind of broader continuum of possibilities to explore and so thanks for that question because it, it's uh, giving me ideas now for like more things to do I very good one. yeah sure go ahead uh, so uh, last week you talked about this sri model for no. uh, normal people and infected people and recovered people um, yeah. so if you look at it just like people then it should surely be discrete so i mean one people two people <laughs> meet and both get infected and so on now then you model it by um, something continuous with these differential equations but is it not correct that to actually solve these equations you need to discretize again <laughs> uh -huh. I think um, well, well, they did invent calculus, so you can use that. Um, but but yeah, I mean, for comp for that for complicated systems of differential equations where you can't solve them analytically, you very typically do solve them by discretizing. You might solve them by discretizing time more than discretizing the number of discretizing the dependent variable. Uh -huh. I mean, unless you count floating points as Discrete. Okay, but um, now I come to the actual question. So could okay. you not mo model it directly with purely discrete petri nets? Like some pandemic or something? Um, yeah, you probably could. I should say that in a, for those petri nets with rates, besides the uh, rate equation semantics, which I was describing last week, where you get deterministic differential equations, where the quantities take continuously ranging values there's also a, a well studied thing called the master equation and th there you talk about the uh tokens is coming in discrete numbers so like you said one people two people three people four people and and you you assign a probability to each of those options so in other words you take the set of markings that i described and you look at probability measures on the set of markings sorry i don't know why i'm doing this but the set of markings was this was this n of, n of s here so that's that's still discrete in the sense that you described but you look at probability uh, distributions on that and you write down a differential equation that describes the evolution of such a probability distribution so it's a stochastic differential equation and so chemists also study that quite a lot and that tends to become worth bothering with when the number of entities is quite small so when you have lots of entities the continuum approximation is pretty good but when you have just like two or three then the then course treating it as a continuum is not a good idea and also if there are some uh, stochastic effects the law of large numbers hasn't kicked in yet so you want to keep track of of, of probabilities in a more fine-grained way but but you may be alluding to like some yet other way to, to go about doing things and there probably are others so yeah so I guess my proposal is that like any respectable semantics for petri nets should give you a symmetric monoidal double functor from the symmetric monoidal double category of open petri nets to something then then you'll have a semantics that's compositional and there should be lots of possible choices of semantics okay thank you so I would say let's now move the discussion to uh, to Zulep. I see that uh, 
Jade and Joe are already answering a lot of questions there. There are some nice discussions going on. So uh, everybody get some coffee and see you all there. Okay, I'm going to get some coffee. Uh, for now, thanks, John, for the very nice okay. talk. Thanks. Thanks to see some familiar faces and lots of other faces. Bye. Great. I'll sign out. And yeah, see you all at the next seminar and on Zolap. Yes. See you.